Hi debaters, this is part one of the 2021-2022 Spartan Debate Institute topic introductions. I'm Maggie Berthium, Director of Debate at Woodward Academy and Spartan Scholars Instructor. In this video, we'll explore the process of federal government water policy, including what parts of the government are involved. First, it's worth briefly reviewing the resolution and why it was chosen to be the 2021-2022 policy debate topic. So, the topic wording is resolved, the United States federal government should substantially increase its protection of water resources in the United States. We'll break this down in subsequent parts of the video. Why are we debating about water resources this year? Well, it's a domestic topic that doesn't overlap other recent topics. The last time we debated about water policy was on the oceans topic, and that was quite a while ago. It also intersects lots of other issues, including environment, regulation, racism, and inequality. And finally, it's in the news. Um, you've probably heard about the Flint water crisis or the droughts that are affecting Western states in the United States right now, and both of those have brought water policy to the forefront of the national discussion. So now we're gonna look at how water policy works in the United States. Congress is generally in charge of authorization and appropriation for federal water projects, and it appropriates funds to agencies that then carry out those policies. This is a brief list of agencies that are involved in water policy. It's not comprehensive, and you don't need to write it down now. We'll look at these in more detail in the rest of the video. You should also know that in addition to the legislative and executive branches, the court system can also be involved in water resource issues by reviewing and approving or rejecting legislation or agency policy. We'll talk about this more in the second part of the video, debating the water resources topic. We'll start by looking at water issues within the territorial bounds of the United States, known as inland waters. There are two agencies that are primarily tasked with planning, constructing, operating, and maintaining the majority of federally owned water resource projects, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Reclamation. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is often shortened to USACE and is also just known as the Corps. It's pronounced Corps, but is spelled C-O-R-P-S. It's a branch of the U.S. Army under the Department of Defense, and it has a nationwide coverage area. It's broadly in charge of navigation, floods, and aquatic ecosystems. It's important to understand why the military is in charge of domestic civil water resources, and the reason is because the original purpose was to make sure the military could move about freely. That required clear and accessible waterways, so this became part of the military mission. USACE areas of responsibility include waterway navigation, which means maintaining and improving inland waterway channels, as well as construction, operation, and maintenance of locks and dams, flood and storm damage protection and management, aquatic ecosystem restoration, as well as shore protection, which means restoring areas after coastal storm damage, but it also means creating and maintaining environmentally sound infrastructure, hydroelectric power. The Corps operates 75 hydro plants, which produce about 25% of the U.S. hydroelectric power capacity, or about 3% of our total electric energy in the United States. Deep water port maintenance, including dredging, which means making ports deeper so that ships can pass through. Water supply, in some cases, the Corps has reservoirs that supply water to 115 U.S. cities. That water is also sometimes used for agriculture. And they're also in charge of water safety and recreation, which means things like maintaining federal beaches, putting out uh, ads that convince people to wear life jackets, that sort of thing. If the issue you're investigating is about inland navigation, locks and dams, flood cleanup, ports, or hydroelectric power, it's probably under the area of the Corps. USACE is funded by omnibus authorization bills approximately every two years called Water Resource Development Acts, or WERDAs. Water Resource Development Acts, or WERDAs, are omnibus pieces of legislation. That means it's a bill that combines many individual bills together and is passed by Congress as one large bill. They occur approximately every two years and they're named after the year they were passed. So the most recent one from December 2020 is WERDA 2020. They provide funding to USACE, including earmarks or directed spending to particular projects, but there's no overall prioritization or strategy. Think of it more like a list of things that Congress has approved. Each water project requires two steps via the WERDA process. First is an authorization for the feasibility study, and then a separate authorization for construction. 
Unlike some other agencies, USACE requires specific authorization from Congress for each project that they do. Sometimes the actual project is then funded in the next WERDA, but most of the time approved projects wait for a separate appropriation through the federal budget process. The problem is that there are a lot of projects that have been authorized but not actually funded. These are known as the USACE construction backlog. Every year, USACE puts out a report of studies and projects that could be completed with additional funding and authorization, known as the Section 7001 report. Current construction backlog is $98 billion, while funding for fiscal year 2021 is only $2.7 billion. That means most projects go unfunded, even if they've been approved, or they get funded a little bit at a time, rather than the whole project at once. This can cause problems for core planning and implementation. Again, the most recent WERDA is WERDA 2020, which was passed in December. It involves a number of things, but the most important elements of WERDA 2020 involve cost sharing, which means increased opportunities for non-federal government and other private entities to participate in water resource project development, construction, and financing. The goal of this is more cost sharing means projects will be built faster and more consistently. A change to the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund WERDA 2020 authorized full utilization of the balance of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, a fee-generated fund. Full use will allow additional dredging of ports and harbors. Previously, there was an unused surplus in the fund. And finally, measures for resilience and innovation. For the first time, uh, the USACE has started to include sea level rise calculations in all of their project planning. The Bureau of Reclamation is a U.S. federal agency under the Department of the Interior. It's tasked with managing water diversion, delivery, and storage projects, especially for areas of irrigation, water supply, and hydropower, but only for the 17 states west of the Mississippi River, which you can see on the map here. Some projects you might have heard of are the California Central Valley Project and the Hoover Dam. Unlike USACE, there's no consistent schedule for Bureau of Reclamation's appropriations. It's much more sporadic, and in many ways it's relatively anachronistic. It was much more active in earlier eras when the federal government was building major water projects in western states. The likely next issue for the Bureau of Reclamation is the western states drought, but there's no clear project planned out already. If the issue you're investigating is about western states specifically and involves large water infrastructure, it may be a Bureau of Reclamation project. In addition to the agencies that deal with federal resource projects, there are other areas of water resources to discuss, like water quality and safety. The Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, is an independent executive agency. In the area of water, it's generally concerned with the quality of the water, both in terms of safety and environmental effects. Discussing some large pieces of legislation that are implemented by the EPA will give you a clearer idea of what it does. First, the EPA implements the Clean Water Act of 1972. That's about pollution control, wastewater standards for industry, and water quality criteria for pollution. It also implements the Safe Water Drinking Act of 1974, which regulates public drinking water supplies. That authorized the EPA to set standards for contaminants in drinking water. The EPA is also in charge of implementing the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act of 2014. That provided financial assistance for water infrastructure projects, including upgrading wastewater and drinking water treatment systems. If the issue you're investigating is about quality of water or pollution standards, it's probably under the EPA. An additional federal agency that does work in water resources is the United States Geological Survey, or USGS. It's a U.S. federal agency under the Department of the Interior. It's in charge of conducting studies of water resources, and it's one of their main mission areas is to deal with water resources. They publish reports on water quality and quantity. They have lots of data, but not always enough funding. If the issue you're investigating is about data and research, it's probably under the USGS. One set of water rights issues outside of the process described above is with native groups. The original treaties negotiated with indigenous groups in the United States didn't include water rights or needs. It wasn't an issue at the time. As it's become an issue, especially in the area of droughts, tribes have started to negotiate settlements with the US government guaranteeing water access. Settlement is generally preferred over lawsuits for financial reasons. The settlements require congressional approval or sometimes agency administrative approval. They're then implemented by either the Bureau of Reclamation or the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is also part of the Department of the Interior. Some of the settlements also include infrastructure funding to get the water to the reservation or tribal area. This often makes them controversial because they can be very expensive. 
As of early this year, approximately 38 groups had negotiated a water rights settlement with the United States. Further areas of research, including guaranteeing access to water rather than negotiating one by one, increasing the number of settlements approved, or fully funding the approved settlements. Another set of water issues that is governed outside the general process described above relates to waters that are shared with our neighboring countries. These are subject to international water agreements. The United States and Canada has an organization called the International Joint Commission. That is a binational organization that manages the shared waterways between the United States and Canada. It approves projects that affect water levels and flows in the Great Lakes and other shared waters like the Columbia River in the Northwest United States. It's also in charge of investigating transboundary issues and making recommendations to both countries. The Boundary Waters Treaty, signed in 1909, negotiated the mechanisms for resolving any disputes over waters between the United States and Canada. It's a treaty that describes general principles rather than detailed rules. This is the treaty that established the ICJ. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, or GLWQA, was signed in 1972 and further amended in 2012. This is a bilateral commitment to protect the Great Lakes, also implemented by the ICJ. It includes provisions on preventing ecological harm, addressing invasive species, and dealing with toxic chemicals. It establishes areas of concern when a particular geographical area doesn't meet the water quality levels established by the treaty. It's primarily run in the United States by the US EPA, but other agencies are also involved. Finally, the Columbia River Treaty, signed in 1961, established the development and operation of dams on the Columbia River Basin in the Northwest United States. It's concerned with energy and flood control, has cost sharing and energy provisions, and was organized by both countries. Four dams were constructed as a result of the Columbia River Treaty, three in British Columbia and one in Montana. There's no specific end date for this treaty, but either country can terminate most provisions with 10 years advance notice after September 2024, or 60 years after the signing of the treaty. In addition to agreements with Canada, the United States has agreements with Mexico about shared waters. The International Boundary and Water Commission, or IBWC, is a U.S.-Mexico binational organization to manage shared resources and resolve disputes, especially on the Colorado and Tijuana rivers and the Rio Grande. It was established under the Water Treaty with Mexico in 1944. That also authorized dam construction on the Rio Grande. There have been some disagreements about which country hasn't been meeting delivery obligations under the treaty. The IBWC has successfully resolved most of those disputes, though often very slowly. A final major area concerns coasts and oceans. The topic says in the United States, so there might be a topicality debate about what exactly constitutes in the United States. The coastal waters of the United States are regulated by the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, which is also known as the Law of the Sea Treaty. It's an international agreement that divides the ocean into regions and determines which country has authority over different parts of the ocean. The United States helped write it and generally abides by it, but we haven't signed it. The treaty divides the ocean into regions with different rights, starting from the nation's coast. A nation's territorial waters, or the territorial sea, extends 12 nautical miles, or 14 miles from the shore. The nation gets to regulate all use by others, set all laws, and use any resource within the territorial waters. Other nations' vessels can go there only if they're going through quickly without stopping and without harming the security or interests of the nation. You can't fish in another country's territorial waters, for example. The contiguous zone extends 12 miles beyond the territorial waters where the country in question can pursue violators of customs, tax, immigration, or pollution laws, as long as part of the violation took place in the territorial waters. Finally, the exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, extends 200 miles from the territorial waters or 188 miles from the contiguous zone. A country has sole use of all nat natural resources within that area. Most development projects in the status quo are in the United States' EEZ. There will be significant topicality debates about what in the United States means in the context of coasts and oceans, whether that means the territorial waters, the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone, or whether the coasts and oceans are off limits altogether. The area in the coasts are governed by the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. That's a federal agency focused on climate, weather, and biodiversity that does some of its own research. Next up is part two of this lecture, debating the water resources topic. Take a minute to take a breather, and I'll see you there soon.